The following message by Alistair Begg is made available by Truth For Life. For more information, visit us online at truthforlife.org. Now, can I encourage you to take your Bible again and turn to the verses that are before us this morning. I hope today, before the day is out, to be able to conclude chapter 8 of Luke. I was staggered in reading my journal to recognize that it was last December that we began the Gospel of Luke. So we're not exactly careening through it, although I don't think we've gone unduly slowly either. We're just moving on. And I would like, if possible, tonight to conclude chapter 8 and then to take some time during this holiday season to deal with other matters, and then as we return at the beginning of a new millennium, uh, to be able to begin chapter 9 with this picture of the authority of Christ being given out to His followers to deal with the world of their day. As I read and reread chapter 8 in preparation for this time, the thought struck me that presumably in the course of events, the disciples who had become the initial followers of Jesus, particularly I'm thinking of Peter, James, and John, who according to the 11th verse of chapter 5, had at the behest of Jesus pulled their boats up on the shore and left everything to follow Him, these individuals, in meeting again with family and with old work colleagues and friends, would doubtless have been on the receiving end of the kind of honest inquiry which would have simply began, so how is it going? What is it like following Jesus around? Now, the reason they would have asked that of them is because it had become so apparent to their friends and neighbors that whatever else was true of these individuals, they were the followers of Jesus Christ. They were spending time with Jesus. They were listening to Jesus teach. And indeed, it was impossible to go and look for Jesus without finding those who were his followers living close by. That is, of course, how it's supposed to be in every generation for those who are the followers of Jesus. It is, of course, one thing to be known as the pastor of a church or a pastor of a church, not necessarily synonymous with being known as a follower of Jesus. Possible to be known as a regular participant in religious affairs, and yet not to be known as a follower of Jesus. And when men and women begin to follow Jesus, those who are not as yet the followers of Christ will have occasion to ask, <clears throat> so how is it going, and what has it really been like to be a follower of Jesus? And the answer, presumably, would have gone along these lines. Well, it's certainly not dull to follow Jesus. Oh, then said the questioner, what kind of thing has been happening? Well, they might have said, one of the most interesting things is the run-in that we've been having with religious leaders. It never occurred to us that we would be so much on the receiving end of abuse from religious quarters. The Pharisees do not like Jesus, and they don't like us. It came out very clearly at the party down at Levi's house. Oh, yes, said somebody, I know Levi's parties. No wonder the Pharisees didn't like it. Well, it wasn't so much that, they said, because this was a different kind of party, because Levi's actually changed too. You're kidding. No, Levi's a follower of Jesus as well. And the party at his house really ticked the Pharisees off because Jesus was keeping company with these sinners and the tax collectors. Indeed, we thought that they would have got excited about the fact that the leper had been healed and that the man who had been let down through the roof by his friends because he was paralyzed had gone up the street carrying his bed and off to see his wife and family. But the religious leaders didn't seem to be excited about that at all. They were far more agitated because they had caught Jesus in the presence of the most unlikely people. I think, frankly, says one of the disciples to the inquirer, they've been on the lookout for us because we were walking away in the middle of nowhere. We were in the farmer's fields. One or two of us began to pick grain. We rubbed it between our hands, and we were eating the kernels. And all of a sudden, from round behind a bush, a few of them popped out and said, Aha, caught you. And Jesus told them a story about a man with a shriveled hand, and he caught them, and they went away with their tails between their legs. It was a wonderful moment. We thoroughly enjoyed it. Well, says the inquirer, what about the teaching of Jesus? We've been hearing that it's quite good. Quite good, said the disciple. It's second to none. Very easy to understand. His illustrations are terrific, and his punchlines are unforgettable. You really ought to try your best to hear him teach sometime. So what's been happening lately? Well, lately, in fact, most recently, 
taking us up, says the individual, to the end of chapter 8, has been like this. We went through the mother of all storms, and you know that we've been in a number of storms out on the Sea of Galilee, but this one was devastating. In fact, a number of us, all of us, if we're honest, were convinced that it was over for us, and we awakened Jesus simply to let him know that it was all over, and Jesus stood up and calmed the storm. Really, it was an amazing moment. And then we encountered this man who was completely out of control, naked and roaming around, and Jesus set him right. Then there was a lady who'd been sick for a while, and he healed her. He somehow knew that she'd touched him, and it was a drama like you wouldn't imagine. And then just to cap it all off, there was the daughter of Jairus who was dead, and he raised her to life. Can you imagine? Can you imagine the people going, oh, well, thank you for sharing that. That is really, uh, that's really quite interesting after all. Frankly, in comparison to my pathetic attempts to explain what it means to be a follower of Jesus, we who are the singers of, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own, and our friends and neighbors say, tell me about some of that stuff. Would you tell me about the last time he told you you were his own? Tell me about what he's been saying to you when you're talking with him and walking with him. You're forced to say, well, uh, well, uh, well, let me tell you about our Christmas program, man. Uh, we, we, I, have, I have these cards here. I, maybe, maybe you could talk with you and walk with you. Well, I said, our friends, your voice sounds a little hollow. Your professions seem a little vain. And I was forcibly struck by the fact that if somebody asked the followers of Jesus what was going on and how was it going, there would be so much that they would have to say concerning the dramatic impact of Christ, not only in their own lives, but in the lives of their friends and acquaintances. Now, when you think upon these lines, and I want to say all of this simply by way of introduction, it is immediately apparent to these disciples that to follow Jesus is no walk in the park. And Luke records this, the early readers of the Gospels, it, living in a church that was being persecuted, would be made forcibly aware of the fact that the church is not a company of people who enjoy a trouble-free life. I get so tired of the way that that is represented in the media and in the news and, and in various other testimonies of people, seeking somehow or another to make the gospel attractive. We understand we're supposed to, but in making it attractive, we mustn't make it untrue. And it is really wrong for us to say to people, you know, if you would come to trust in Christ and cast all your care upon Him, then you would just enjoy a, just a wonderful time. You won't have to deal with storms. You won't have to deal with sickness. You won't have to deal with demons, and you won't have to deal with death. Oh, says somebody, well, where do you get that from? Because I was reading chapter 8 of Luke's gospel, and I discovered that when they began to follow Jesus, they were dealing with storms, sickness, demons, and death. And the storm reminds us forcibly that obedience to Christ often has thrust individuals into all kinds of adverse circumstances. The demon-possessed man exemplifies all of the evil that affects our minds and our personalities as we walk through this world. And the final two incidents of the chapter, to which we'll come this evening, God willing, emphasize the reality of sickness and the eventuality of death. So let it be said clearly and straightforwardly from the Bible that the followers of Jesus are not free from trouble, disappointment, pain, or regret, and we dare not offer to others the prospect of a trouble-free existence and call it the normal Christian life. It's not true to the Bible, and it's not true to us. And it is very, very unhelpful. And Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. If you follow me, he says, you may find yourself at loggerheads with your spouse. You may find all kinds of trouble with your mom and dad or with your teenage son and daughter. Why? Because the follower of me will be so radically changed that it will alter every dimension of their existence. That could make some of us wonder whether we are followers of Jesus, couldn't it? and cause us to examine ourselves to see if we are of the faith, to see if we have actually laid hold of His great and precious promises, to see whether His Spirit has really come to live within our lives, to see whether it is true for us to say what the Bible says concerning being His follower. 
Now, this comes out clearly in this one particular incident, which we're going to um, zip through. Some of you are saying, I'll believe that when it's happened. <laughs> okay, I, I understand your caution and your skepticism, and I appreciate your honesty. I'm going to try to be as honest in my zipping here. First of all, just simply notice the location in which this event takes place, the location opposite Galilee. This is more than a geographical note by Luke. It represents Jesus' first foray into Gentile country. Jesus, as a Jew, is now moving into an environment that is clearly off-limits and unclean for a good Jewish rabbi. The Jews were ceremonially unclean as a result of encountering those who had come from graves or funeral processions or from tombs. Demons and pigs were not regarded as those with whom the Jew was supposed to be spending much time. These are all indications of the fact that this Gentile environment is markedly different from the one out of which Jesus has come even in the crossing of the lake. Although you'll have to take my word for this, I hope you will, that the designation cried out at the top of this man's voice concerning Jesus, Jesus, Son of the Most High God, is a peculiarly Gentile declaration. So what we discover at the beginning of the chapter is that Jesus is going from town to town, from village to village, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom of God. The twelve are with him, and he moves geographically to a different location, but it is the same good news. And Luke is about to show how the lesson of the parable of the sower is appropriate in the Gentile world also. So the reader is reading and saying to himself, I wonder now, as Jesus goes into the Gentile world and sows the seed of his word, I wonder what the reaction will be. And we're going to, as the story draws to a close, be quite staggered, I hope, to recognize that the townsfolk who might seem the most likely believers become the seed that is on the path, or they are the soil of the path, and the demoniac, who is the most unlikely of believers, proves himself to be the good soil. Well, from the location of the incident to the condition of the man. We find this in verse 27 and largely in verse 29. You can put it together as a sort of identical picture. If you were drawing the man, these features would come out, and if you were describing his characteristics in prose, then these words and adjectives would be necessary to complete the picture. We discover that this man has not worn clothes or lived in a house for a long time. He roams around naked, and his dwelling is in the local cemetery. Not the kind of ordered cemetery with which we are familiar, but probably caves on the hillside, nevertheless identified as the place of the dead. And in that precinct, driven into solitary confinement by the impact of demonic activity, this man was exercising his pathetic existence. He's the kind of individual that schoolboys would like to go and try and find on their way home from school. Let's go and see if we can find the crazy man. Let's go and see if we can get the naked man to come out and chase us. The boys are not laughing. The girls may be laughing. Boys always do this. Their mothers tell them, do not come home via the cemetery. There is a crazy man there, and I want you to stay as far away from him as possible. Yes, mother, says the boy goes to school, says to his friend, we're going home by the cemetery this evening. <laughs> because there is some kind of weird thrill involved in trying to make the crazy man come out. What is it about this man? Why does he have no clothes on? Why does he shout as he does? Why is he as repulsive as he looks? And why does he keep cutting himself with a sharp edge of stones? For clearly this man is simply a public nuisance. He's completely uncontrollable. They had chained him. They had tried to tie him both by hand and by foot. They had put him under guard, and yet he had broken his chains and scared all the guards away. They had had no long-term success with their policy of dealing with the homeless. They had no long-term success in knowing just what to do with this man who was clearly out of his mind. Frankly, as an aside, at the end of the 20th century, we don't have much better plans right now today for dealing with the homeless and for those who are out of their minds. Every honest psychiatrist will tell you the best we can do is drug them up and hope that they won't do any damage to themselves or anybody else. And for the homeless, the best we can do is lock them up so that they won't throw stones at one another and die of the freezing cold and make New York an even more embarrassing place in which to live. 
Where is Jesus in all of this? Is Jesus a Jesus for the homeless and the crazy? And if he is, why are we not hearing about it? And why is the church not on the front end of every program that is involved with those who are totally destabilized and marginalized? For the same reason that we tell our children, stay away from that man, he's crazy, I don't want you talking with him. And we move our seat on the bus or on the plane in order to move away from those who are marginalized, destabilized, and ought to, in our estimation, be hospitalized for the rest of their lives. Now, that's not to put ourselves on an undue guilt trip, but it is to acknowledge that a well-heeled congregation like this knows very, very little at all about dealing with such things, and frankly, we're glad that we know very little, and we would be dreadfully disappointed to discover that somebody wanted to lead a charge into the inner city during the late watches of the night to offer blankets and soup to those who find themselves the marginalized of society. I'm still waiting for somebody to emerge from the congregation to say, I want to start a ministry that will take place all during the night, and I'm going to go down under bridges and into different places, and I'm going to reach the marginalized of society. You say, well, why don't you start it? Well, I'm supposed to talk about it. You're supposed to start it. <laughs> and if you start it, I'll come with you. This man had crossed the boundaries of human decency. He had absolutely lost any claim to status at all. It would have been a joke to ask this man for his identification, wouldn't it? Where would he have kept it? Don't go there. <laughs> Do you have any identification? Diner's card? Access? American Express? Bank statement? Driver's license? Then I'm sorry, sir. You do not exist. He had been reduced essentially to the level of a wild animal. He was demonized, he was marginalized, and he was hopeless. So the location of the incident, the condition of the man, and thirdly, the confrontation between Christ and this individual. It's clearly a combination of attraction and fear. And it happens almost instantaneously. You will notice that when Jesus, verse 7, stepped ashore, he was met by a demon-possessed man from the town. Now, if you're reading carefully, you say, well, if he was from the town, why wasn't he in the town? Then you read on further, and you realize why he wasn't in the town. But initially, all you know is that there was a man, and he was from the town, and he ran down and he met Jesus. And you have this dramatic picture of this individual perhaps watching from his vantage point among the tombs, seeing these people coming, seeing the master emerge from the boat, and instantaneously he's in his face. And isn't it interesting that he is able to give to him such a clear designation? Verse 28, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God, what do you want with me? Now, if you look just a couple of verses up to verse 25, where we left the disciples last time in fear and amazement, they were asking one another a question that none of them were able to come up with the answer to. They were asking, who is this? Notice that the demon-possessed man knows the answer to the question that the disciples who are spending time with Jesus don't know the answer to. They want to know who it is, and the demon-possessed man says, you're the Son of the Most High God. How did that happen? Well, the answer is in James chapter 2, verse 19 where James tells us that the demons believe and they shudder, that the demonic world is not in any doubt this morning about the reality of Christ, about the identity of Jesus, that those who are held in the grip of satanic bondage are absolutely orthodox in their view of the doctrine of God. They know that God is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They do the things they do in a direct and overt challenge to the very orthodoxy of belief. And what the disciples had still not grasped, the demon world had known for some time, that this Jesus of Nazareth is none other than the Son of the God, Son of God Most High. And that is why, knowing his identity, they ask, first of all, that he will not torture them. I beg you, says the man, don't torture me. Now, the reason for that request is clear. The demon understood that in the presence of the Holy One, namely Jesus, destruction was its only prospect. Now, there is a whole arena of teaching here into which we're not about to go, but let me say this, at least in passing. 
Evil spirits are real. Demonic activity is real. Not everything that purports to be satanic and demonic is itself satanic and demonic, but there is satanic and demonic activity. Not something that was buried in the first century, certainly that was intense in the first century, but nevertheless something that has continued throughout. Because the devil seeks to duplicate everything that God has done. God has incarnated himself in the person of his Son. And so the devil comes by his minions, and he seeks to incarnate himself by imposing himself with his evil forces in the minds and personalities and hearts of those who open themselves up to demonic activity, who engage in stuff like Ouija boards, who play fast and loose with the, uh, the, 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 that garbage in the newspaper that makes you a Pisces or a Gemini or, or a Sagittarius or whatever else it is. In the threshold of these things, people are opening themselves up to that realm of world which is a real world. And these evil forces work for only one thing, for destruction. For destruction. And they lead people to destruction, and they lead people to the destruction of themselves. That is why, and we can take this out of the tape, but let me say it now, that is why I have little doubt that in most of the mass killings that we have seen in this last year, there is demonic activity involved. For the individuals have eventually killed themselves because the evil one's purpose is eventually to bring down to the abyss those who have signed on for his service. And this man, by whatever means, found himself possessed by this demonic activity. And it was all and is all opposed to the incarnate Lord the Christ. And so, don't torture me is the first request. And second request is, don't send us into the abyss. Now, that's in verse 31. They begged him repeatedly, don't, don't send us into the abyss. Now, we need to go back into the Old Testament and put this whole picture together, but essentially it is the abode of the dead. And the demon world, again, is aware of the fact that on the day of judgment, their freedom is gone. They no longer can roam around and do their dirty work. Their doom is sealed. So recognizing that Christ, the Holy One, who is the judge, now stands before them and confronts them in the person of this man, they realize that Christ has the power right then and there to consign them to the abyss for all time. And what they're saying is, would you let us hang around a little longer? Please don't bring the judgment of the end into time today. Please don't torture us, and please don't send us into the abyss. And for whatever reason, Christ accedes to their request. Because, you see, demons are not on a strength with Jesus. And Satan is not on a strength with Jesus. That is dualism. In the mystery of God's providence, the devil is only able to do what Jesus allows it to do, him to do, and demons are only able to operate as per the overruling providential care of Christ. Now, the man's personality has clearly been so destabilized that the demons usurping the place of his own selfhood speak through him. And if you have ever been involved with demon possession, you know the uneerie, unnerving weirdness of it when somebody that you know speaks to you with a completely different voice. And there is no question in that moment that you are dealing there with a dimension that is beyond the normal. And that is exactly what Christ is encountering here. The man speaks, and yet the demons speak. What's your name? Our name is Legion. For there were, says Luke, a whole ton of these individuals. And they had invaded this man's psyche and his personality as a whole. What a picture of complete hopelessness, huh? I mean, you just read to this point in the story, if your Bible was torn, 
Somebody had given you a Bible and it was torn and you had only read to there. And you said, man, alive, you know, I can't imagine what happens next. There's no possibility for that man. I mean, he must be a, a sermon illustration or something. But no, you see, he who is Lord of nature in the stilling of the storm, he who is Lord of death in the raising of Jairus' daughter, he who is Lord of life in the restoration of sickness, is he who is Lord of all in the presence of demonic activity. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. You don't need to go out and be tyrannized by this kind of thing, believers. Don't go out and start buying all these books by Neil Anderson about the, you know, breaking the bondage and all that stuff. Leave that stuff well alone. You won't find it in our bookstore, and we're not planning on carrying it. And don't read Peretti's books as if you were reading the Bible. It's fiction. And don't look for demons on the shoulder of everybody that's sitting beside you in the church. Just read your Bible. Just read your Bible. Now let's come to the destruction of the pigs, because I know many of you are waiting for this part. <laughs> All the pig lovers have been waiting now to see what we ought to do with this. Because this is strange, isn't it? I mean, this is a strange story. Liberal scholars just mess around with it. Barclay, whose commentaries are helpful historically and in, in word studies, completely violates himself when he gets to the matter of the miraculous. And what he does with this is really a joke. He turns it into the story of the three little pigs, only it's much worse. So if you have Barclay, remember you put a big red cross through his dealing with the miracles. You can read the rest, but you mark out his miraculous stuff. He's completely out to lunch. He's dead now, so don't worry about writing to me about why I said that about him. Um, he was Scottish. He was a professor of New Testament at Glasgow University. He was a wonderful man, but he had a real problem with the miracles. And his stuff here goes that the man started to run around. He got a bit skittered. He got the pigs skittered. The pigs all got skittered, and the pigs all started to run around. They all ran and drowned themselves, and there you have it. He, he, he singularly makes the miracles even more miraculous than they actually are every time, every time he touches them. You know, Jesus was not walking on the water. His feet were on the bottom. And that's why it looked like he was walking on the water. And there were 12 people in a huge big boat that weighed about three and a half tons, which is apparently floating on four inches of water, you know, which is a greater miracle than Jesus walking on the water, that kind of thing. <laughs> so in other words, read all your books with care. The best of men are men at best. And listen to all sermons with great care as well. Calvin suggests that the demons in inhabiting the pigs and wanting to inhabit the pigs may have been in order to, to uh, excite the inhabitants of the particular region to curse God on account of the fact that they'd lost the pigs. So the demons don't want these people to believe in Christ. So they say, can we go in the pigs, knowing that the pigs are so much a part of their economic substance that if the pigs all go where they're about to go, then the people will be really ticked because they lost their pigs. Then they will hate Christ. Then they will send them away. That's pretty ingenious, isn't it? If I thought for the rest of my life, I don't think I could think that up. Whether it's true or not, I haven't the foggiest idea, and frankly, neither is Calvin. But the fact is that Jesus does what he does with the pigs. I had to harness myself. I found my mind was going all kinds of directions, and I had to get it under control as late as last evening. And I reminded myself that in considering this incident, I have to be content to treat the account on the level that it is offered to me in the Bible, and not try to answer questions that it doesn't address. Which is, of course, a real danger for preachers. You know, let's show people how esoteric I can be by introducing you to these questions that nobody knows the answers to, including myself. And it's a dreadful waste of time. So how can animals be possessed? There's one of the questions. How can animals be possessed? Don't know. Two, why would Jesus allow such things to happen to these animals? I have a thought on that to which I come, but it's not brilliant. Three, what happened to the demons after they went into the pigs and after the pigs drowned? Where do they go then? Don't know. <laughs> Four, why did the demons feel compelled to indwell something, namely pigs, rather than just say, could we please go to Judea? Don't know. And anybody who tells you that he knows, stay away from him or her. And if you're in a home Bible study and they tell you they know the answer to those questions, move your seat. <laughs> For the demoniac was not as crazy as the person you're sitting next to. <laughs> 
What we have here is a dramatic sneak preview of God's messianic power, that the lion will one day lie down with the lamb. And people say, how could that ever be? Lions tear lambs apart. No, the lion will lie down with the lamb. Why? When the Messiah comes in all of his glory and sets the creative order to rights in all of its pristine beauty. And so it is that as he deals with this circumstance, whatever else we might say about it, Jesus judged the life of this individual, his sanity, his wholeness, and his conversion— to be significantly more of significantly more value than that attached to a herd of pigs. Right? And we have to conclude that. That for Jesus to grant permission for the demons to go into the pigs, albeit it was demonic activity that resulted in their drowning, and everything that Jesus does, he does with justice and with righteousness and is flawless in all of his dealings. For Jesus to do that, we know at least this that in the economy of human existence and in the framework of our view of the world, the sanity and wholeness and transformation of this man was worth what happened to all those pigs. Now, I want to pause on this for just a moment because it raises the question of the Christian worldview in light of the increasingly forceful animal rights activist lobby. Now, I can't go into all of this now. We'll do it in a Q&A session some evening when we're running out of questions. But a Christian worldview maintains that our stewardship over the created order is just that, a stewardship. Gives no grounds to the Christian to abuse or to treat as, uh, as, as refuge or as garbage, garbage, that which God has created for our enjoyment or for our food or for anything else. However, God in His wisdom has made us in the image of God. He has given us a soul that He has not given to the rest of the creative order that he has put all things under our feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the paths of the sea. Therefore, we have stewardship for that. Now, for some of you, that allows you then to go and shoot deer. It doesn't actually allow me to go and shoot deer for a couple of reasons. One, because I don't want to, and two, because I'd probably kill myself with a sight rather than ever kill a deer. But it doesn't give me the freedom to go and engage in those sports because I just don't think that I have the legitimacy to do that. I just don't want to do that, if you like. Exercising my freedom, I choose to curtail it. I don't believe it is a violation on your part to do it because of our view of humanity and of the, the, the structure that God has given us. But the animal rights lobby right now has put humanity and uh, the animal world on a par with one another. So, for example, I was with a man. This just sounds like name-dropping, but, but it isn't. But I was with Ralph Larson, who is the chairman of Johnson & Johnson. We were playing golf together. And I said to him, I said, how do you get things through at the moment in terms of biomedical research when you have all these animal rights activists showing up at all your meetings? He said, it is the singular hardest thing we have to face. And then he told me this story. At a most recent meeting in which they were offering a new drug and had to go through test trials in which they were using various animals, the animal rights activists came to represent themselves at the meeting, and they were holding sway for a long time. A gentleman stood up and asked the lady who was arguing the case for the validity of an animal being equivalent to a man, a gentleman stood up and said to her, if a dog was drowning and a child was drowning, which would you save first? And her answer was, it would depend whose dog it was and whose child it was. 
In other words, if it was my dog, I'd save the dog first. If it was my child, I'd save that. Now, the meeting ended in a complete furor. The lady was essentially driven out of the room, even by those who had arrived as animal rights activists. They said, enough is enough. Let me tell you something. As we go into the 20th century, the 21st century, some of us are going into the 20th century. <laughs> let, let me invite some of you to try the 20th century before we finish it. <laughs> it's only a matter of moments left, but if we are going to be able to speak into our world, we're going to have to be able to speak, and I've told you this before, and I want to just keep reminding you of it. You're going to have to speak cohesively, sensibly, about the exclusivity of Jesus. That there is only one way to go to heaven through Jesus. That notion is marginalized not only in contemporary culture, secular, but it is marginalized within the framework of the church. Secondly, you're going to have to be able to articulate a biblical view of human sexuality that has to do with maleness and femaleness. Thirdly, you're going to have to be able to deal with this issue of the place of man in the great cosmic scheme of things vis-a-vis -vis the matter of what an animal is or what an animal is not. And there are some more that I can't remember just now. In order to reinforce this, I want to read to you something that I listened to this week, and some of you will have listened to it as well. It was The Breakpoint by Chuck Colson on December 1st, and it had to do with a lady and her chickens. Did any of you re listen to this? Some of you did. Three of you did. Okay, fine. Good. Well, the rest of you are all ears, I'm sure. The subject was Chicken Crusade, colon, Evidence of Human Dignity, question mark. It's quicker for me to read it. Listen. Is the, is the slaughter of chickens comparable to the Holocaust? Karen Davis says yes, and she's devoted her life to saving them. In a recent Washington Post interview, Davis described poultry farms as, quotes, huge prison camps where chickens are humiliated, tortured, and murdered. Yes, murdered. In a recent Washington Post interview, she's, no, sorry, that's the previous paragraph. In a strange, I might say feather brain sort of way, Davis, who says she does not believe in God, is providing evidence of God's existence and of the unique role human beings play in his creation. At her Virginia home, Davis keeps more than 100 chickens, many of whom she has rescued after they fell off poultry trucks. She devotes hours every day. Listen, listen, listen. This is consistent with her worldview. You shouldn't laugh. I mean, it, it's bizarre, but it's actually not funny. What do you care about enough to go and rescue it off the back of a truck? Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, tell them of Jesus, mighty to save. That's consistent with our worldview. This is her worldview. Okay, it's crazy, I know. She devotes hours every day caring for them and spends the rest of her time fighting political battles on their behalf. The cause has not been without its sacrifices. Davis' husband, tiring of her single-minded devotion to chickens, left her. Her home is almost entirely bereft of furniture so the chickens can roam freely. Davis is so committed to her fowls that she even missed her father's funeral to care for them. Of course, Scripture teaches that Christians ought to be stewards over animals. But is it normal to view chickens as the moral equivalent of humans and to sacrifice everything for their sake? Most animal rights activists would answer yes, because they believe in Darwinian evolution, which teaches that there is no clear dividing line between animals and humans. But Darwinian evolution teaches other things as well, things that don't fit so comfortably with Davis's commitment. Darwinists teach that life has no meaning or purpose. They also teach the survival of the fittest, the idea that the strong survive and the weak get selected out. But Davis's fanatical commitment to chickens flies in the face of this naturalistic belief. A consistent naturalist, you see, would not care if chickens were winnowed out by a stronger species. But Davis does care. She believes that humans, as the stronger and more intelligent species, ought to protect the weaker species. 
Where does she get that sense of oughtness from? Clearly, something is driving Davis to rise above her own self-interest. That something, however misdirected, is the image of God planted in all of us, which makes us realize we're created for a higher purpose. Davis's devotion to her feathers' friends is evidence that she's looking for something transcendent, for some calling beyond herself. She's proving that the Darwinian worldview is false because she cannot live with its logical conclusions. The true test of a worldview, after all, is whether it conforms to reality. Davis says she does not believe in God, and yet in a twisted way, by seeking a higher purpose, she's validating the Christian worldview. It's tempting to laugh off people like Davis as eccentrics. We've proved that. But Davis is well-educated, a former college professor. People like her are deadly serious. The real problem is that she and other animal rights activists have a flawed worldview, a wrong understanding of the doctrine of creation. Animal rights activists are having a serious impact. Our job is to expose the failure in their underlying belief system and then lead them to the one who cares about every sparrow that falls to the ground and who values humans so much more that he sent his son to die for them. I thank God for the brilliant mind of Chuck Colson, who is able in a matter of sentences to convey so much immensely helpful information. How did we get to that? Because Jesus valued the soul of one messed up man as being worth far more than however many demonized pigs drowned themselves at the bottom of the lake. So the reaction of the people, what was it? Well, we would expect that they would say, anybody who can do this with this man, we want to hear from him. We want Jesus to stay here and begin a campaign. In fact, let's put up posters. Speaking tonight at the Greater Gerizim's men's banquet is the transformed demoniac. But no, in point of fact, the transformed demoniac produces no evangelism on the part of these people. In fact, they are fearful when they find him sitting clothed and in his right mind. He'd been demon-possessed, and now he was free of demons. He'd been naked and out of his mind. Now he had clothes on, and he was perfectly sensible. He had fallen down and shouted at the top of his voice, and now he was sitting beside Jesus, peacefully sitting at his feet. And the fulfillment of the prophecy that Jesus had quoted in in, uh, Luke chapter 4 in the synagogue in Nazareth was again being fulfilled. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to release the oppressed. Now, our time is gone. Let me just say a word concerning the commission the man received. The reaction of the people was to ask Jesus to leave, and he acceded to their request. The reaction of the demons was to ask Jesus to send them into the pigs, and they acceded to their request. And the the request of the man was to go with Jesus, and Jesus said, no, you can't come. In other words, it's the reverse of what we might have imagined. Small surprise that the man would want to stay with Jesus, don't you think? Jesus, don't leave me here. They all know me. I've been running around naked for so long, it would be nice for me to get out of the place. It's quite embarrassing as I look at people now in the marketplace and they look at me. I know, I know they're thinking, man alive, you should see him with his clothes off. He's an ugly mess. I wouldn't like that. I must leave here, Jesus. Let me come with you. After all, you're the one that fixed me, and if I stay with you, I can be sure that I'm fixed. If I stay by myself, maybe I'll go back the way I was again. Jesus, please let me come. And look at Jesus' commission to him, verse 39. Return home and tell your family how much God has done for you. Just go home and tell your family. He said, they'll know. You and I say I have to say a lot. They'll know. So Jesus leaves, but he leaves behind a missionary, one whose transformation would be so obvious to them all. Jesus goes through a storm to the other side of the lake to meet a man who was marginalized and demonized, who had lost any sense of status in society, who was completely without hope and was a figure of fun and fear. Jesus goes through the storm, across the lake, sets his feet on the ground, meets one individual, transforms his life, and gets back on the boat and leaves again. Does that tell you something about Jesus? Do you remember what he tells in the story of the Good Shepherd? The Good Shepherd gives his life for the sheep. There were ninety and nine, and they were all safely in. And there was one that was out somewhere. And the shepherd, will he not, says Jesus, leave the ninety and nine and go out and search for the one? Because he's more concerned about one who hasn't come to faith than the ninety-nine who have no need of repentance. 
And the hymn writer puts it, there were ninety and nine that safely lay in the shelter of the fold, but one was out on the hills away far off from the gates of gold. Lord, you have here your ninety and nine. Are they not enough for you? And none of the ransom never knew how deep were the waters crossed or how dark was the night that the Lord passed through ere he found the sheep that was lost. Here's the deal. I know that I am not speaking this morning to demoniacs that have come out of the tombs. I notice that you are all clothed and apparently marginally in your right minds. But I do know this, that I'm speaking to people that if ever your clothes spiritually were to be taken off and you were seen in full view by the person next to you, you couldn't stand the gaze. And you come to worship, and you think that by currying in amongst the crowd that Christ is somehow interested in the crowd, and if you just get in with a crowd, he's up for the crowd, and, and if you manage to pull yourself in the group, you'll be okay because Jesus is into crowds. Listen, Jesus is into individuals. And it's actually the reverse. He comes amongst the pews to the battle-scarred, to the broken, to the demonized, to the marginalized. There may be some of you here this morning, you're actually involved in demonic activity. You're playing with that material. You go back to it again and again via the internet or via some group of individuals out in Jogger County with whom you go and spend time, and you are trapped, you're enslaved, and you cannot get yourself free. But behind that nice dress and behind that brightly colored sweater or that tie, you manage to keep it clean for those who know you best. Or do you remember our song, Make the Book Lift to Me, O Lord? Show me yourself within your word. Show me myself. And show me my Savior. Did you pray that? God, I believe, will answer that prayer. And he looks for the one. The townsfolk said, get out, and he left. And the one man who was so bereft of any hope was totally changed. Who can change? Who can cheer the heart like Jesus by his presence all divine, you know? True and tender, pure and precious. Oh, what bliss to call him mine. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. That's what the guy would have been singing. And the fairest of 10,000 in my blessed Lord I see. That's conversion, incidentally. That's transformation. That's what Jesus does. We can make ourselves religious. Only Christ can change our lives. Let us pray together. Oh God, our Father, we thank you for the Bible, and we thank you for Jesus. And as we get ready to walk out of this place, we pray that where you are stirring within our hearts, you'll give us grace to pause and to meet with those in our prayer room who are there ready to pray with us, to talk, to guide us accordingly. We pray that, like the man, we might go home and tell our family and our friends the wonderful things that you have done for us. May we not talk about Parkside or about people, but about Jesus. And unto him, the one who is able to keep us from falling and to present us faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, now and forevermore. Amen. This message was brought to you from Truth For Life, where the learning is for living. To learn more about Truth For Life with Alistair Begg, visit us online at truthforlife.org.